A new paper by a prominent American virologist has called into question a string of high-profile news reports about the role that raccoon dogs may have played in the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic. That's according to new reporting from independent journalist Jimmy Tobias in The Intercept. Now, according to Tobias, media reports create a false impression of a major breakthrough linking animals to COVID's origins. Joining us now to break it all down is Jimmy Tobias himself. Welcome back to Rising. Thanks for having me. So great to talk to you. So please summarize this uh, for us. Obviously, we saw you know all the the headlines pointing to oh the genetic material at the wet market is it, it's in such numbers. There's and also the raccoon dog genetic material case closed. That was kind of the framing of, of all of that for a long while. And then and now I understand a, a lot of people saying actually there's much more to the story and it was not you know dispositive at all. What's your evaluation? Yeah, those articles and statements, which, you know, mostly appeared in March this year, um, were based on data from hundreds of environmental swabs that were collected at, uh, you know, from cages, carts and other surfaces at the Wanan Seafood Wholesale Market in Wuhan, China. Um, and they were collected on January, starting on January 1st, 2020, after Chinese authorities shut that market down because um, of the outbreak, the COVID outbreak in the city. Um, and, you know, many people, um, some people have thought that that the seafood market was sort of the site of the spillover event or the potential site of a spillover event and others see it more as just a, you know, a super spreader venue early on in the pandemic. And so these data, you know, were, were sought after and weren't released by the Chinese CDC until this year. And, um, and Jesse Bloom is, is a prominent uh, virologist um, based out of Seattle. And late last month, he took his own look at this data and basically his conclusion, you know, he came to conclusions that were that were pretty at odds with the media coverage, the early media coverage uh, of what these data showed. Um, you know, he, he didn't say in his report that, you know, there were no infected animals at the market, but he found that the data from the swabs really provide no evidence one way or another about whether raccoon dogs or other animals at the market were infected. And and he also really highlighted what what I think is probably the most significant limitation of this data which is that it was collected at least a month after the first human infections in Wuhan. And so he told me, you know, he told me that it's just very hard to take data collected that far downstream of initial entry into humans and really to convincingly support any precise scenario for how for how the virus got into people. And overall, you know, Bloom Bloom is kind of still in the camp that is very unclear at this time how SARS-CoV-2 first entered humans. Jimmy, why why raccoon dogs? Why did that particular animal seem to take the world by storm? Is it just because it's a funny sounding animal and if there were something called a giraffe cat, we'd have been talking about that instead? <laughs> well, you know, raccoon dogs are shown to be susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 and they were known to be sold at this market. And so they're one candidate. They're adorable. Speed. You should know. Yeah, they're, they're adorable. adorable. <laughs> they, they're like fox-like animals. You know, they're very cute. Um, but yeah, so, you know, they're a plausible candidate species for an intermediate host. And and so that's one reason. But, you know, I think, that the, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example of kind of how Bloom's analysis differed from the, the media coverage of this. Um, the New York Times focused on one swab collected um, at this market in particular. It was a swab labeled Q61. It was collected from a, a cart in the southwest corner of the market on January 12, 2020. It was designated as positive for SARS-CoV-2 in the China CDC data set. And it also contained a large quantity of raccoon dog genetic material and very little human genetic material. And so the media made a big deal out of this swab because it contained both raccoon dog genetic material in abundance and it was labeled positive for SARS-CoV-2. And it was, a, you know, so this was a key factor that fueled all these headlines. But, but, but when Bloom really did his own analysis of this swab, um, he found that the swab not only, not only tested negative by RT-QPCR testing for SARS-CoV-2. Um, he also looked at the genetic, you know, the amount of, of SARS-CoV-2 genetic material in this swab. And there was only one of roughly 200 million reads of SARS-CoV-2. So, that's a, so this swab had a very, very tiny amount of SARS-CoV-2 material. Um, one scientist told me that amount is beyond insignificant. And so this swab really wasn't 
what it was made out to be in the media reports. And, and what's more, Bloom found that, the, you know, this was the only swab above a certain threshold for raccoon dog genetic material that contains any SARS-CoV-2 RNA material at all. So, you know, 13 of the 14 samples with the most raccoon dog genetic material had no SARS-CoV-2 reads, and this one, you know, had one in 200 million. So, so you know, th there, was a, there was a difference between how the media covered this and, and what, you know, his analysis showed. And he, you know, in the context of sort of a staid scientific paper, he had kind of harsh words for the media coverage of, of this data. Yeah, and, and, you know, to be clear, we're not overstating this. The, I'm reading The Atlantic. Here's their headline this, re referencing this, uh, the, the raccoon dog theory. They call it the strongest evidence yet that an animal started the pandemic. A new analysis of genetic samples from China appears to link the pandemic's origin to raccoon dogs. And, and, and now we have, right, what, what Bloom found, which is that I'm, now I'm quoting from the New York Times summary of Bloom's findings, which is that, um, D, the, D, the presence of raccoon dog DNA was negatively correlated with the presence of SARS-CoV-2 material because of, as, as you just explained, there was one sample where it was, you know, pretty compelling, but then the rest it wasn't. Uh, Bloom found notably several kinds of, uh, that, that, that the presence of SARS-CoV-2 was much more closely associated with genetic material from other species, notably several kinds of fish, and to a lesser extent, um, humans, um, and it is implausible biologically, obviously, that the virus came uh, from fish. So it's it really a you know a strong mismatch between what we're finding out later and what these headlines said at the time. Yeah, and you know some of those stories also quoted scientists saying things like you know this is a really strong indication that animals at the market were infected. There's really no other explanation that makes any sense, and things like this isn't an infected animal, but this is the closest you can get without having the animal in front of you. And I think Bloom's analysis really shows that those kinds of statements um, don't quite match up with what the data show. And, you know, I talked to um, a scientist for my story, Dr. James Allwine of the University of Pennsylvania, who who's in favor of a natural origin theory for the virus. But he said, you know, he said he's always worried about the sensationalism that comes out with these kinds of discoveries because it just goes against his idea of, of how science should be talked about to the public, you know, and he, you know, he also says scientists are human too. They can get carried away. Um, don't they? Don't always say the right things, but it has a deleterious effect. And yeah, you know, I think you know overall, Bloom's analysis did confirm some of the you know findings that were reported in these news stories. For instance, that you know there were raccoon dogs present at this market in the run up to its closure on January first. But again, you know, he, he really strongly showed. You know, he says, you know. These these data were collected a month, at least a month after SARS-CoV-2 entered the human population. And so you really have to keep that sort of thing in mind um, when you're reporting on this sort of thing. You can't just jump to conclusions. And and I think I think his report really kind of helped clarify what's become a media spectacle, maybe tamp down some of the more sensationalism and give us a clearer look at what's happening what's happening with these data. And, and, you know, this is a scientific process. It's ongoing. People are still looking at these data, analyzing them. He just submitted his paper for peer review. Um, but, you know, you know, as reporters, we, I guess I'd say we have to be careful about, about what we say. I mean, the Atlantic framing this as the strongest evidence yet that uh, there's a genetic origin here, you know, it seems to me to be a line that benefits folks who don't want to talk about lab leak theory. Um, and it seems like it was pretty effective in terms of a kind of a media persuasion technique. What do they say about a lie goes around the world twice before the truth gets out of the gate? I'm sure there are a lot of people who, at some place, part of the recesses of their mind, will continue to hold on to this idea that there has been more and more evidence that there's a zoonotic origin here. I mean, do you, do you see this as an, you know, an, what for, well, first, let me ask you what you think the motives here are, if, you, if I'm being un, unfair about why this story had such legs on it. And two, do you think it worked? You know, I can't really speak to the motives of anyone involved. I, you know, I don't know the inside story of how this got out there like this. Um, but, you know, it is notable that these news headlines came out before there was even a report um, from from an initial uh, team of scientists who looked at the data, before that report was even public. So I think there is this sense that there's, you know, people are trying to, and it's partly it's journalism, you know, you're trying to get the scoop. But, um, you know, with science, I, th I think one has to be a little more careful than that. And as for, you know, the impact, 
I mean, th this debate is just so, um, you know, it's, it's very complicated, it's heated. Um, but I, I appreciate what Jesse Bloom was trying to do, which was kind of like take a calm, sober look at the data. And, and you know, like I said before, he feels still after, after all this time that it's still very unclear how SARS-CoV-2 entered humans. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a good thing to keep in mind um, as investigation, scientific research, et cetera, continues into the origin of this pandemic. Jimmy, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.